All right, good afternoon. Now that the sugar levels have dropped to an all-time low, fantastic. So listen, I, you know, as Andrew and I prepared and we you know, started to think about what we wanted to talk about, I was actually reminded of a story I heard, and it was about uh, some moose hunters. And I can tell you this is particularly relevant. Andrew is from Canada, so he brings the moose. I'm from Texas, so I bring the guns. Seems, seems important. And the story goes like this. There were apparently uh, a couple of hunters who wanted to go up in a very remote region and hunt moose. So they hired a pilot with a plane, one of those planes with the pontoons, flew him in there, landed in the lake, let him out and said, knock yourselves out. See you in three days. Takes off. Three days later, the pilot comes back, lands the plane. Here come the, the two hunters. They've got all their gear and two giant moose. Meese? Moose? Moose. I have to ask Andrew. He's the expert. <laughs> and so the pilot says they start to get their gear in the plane, and they start to put the moose on the plane. And the pilot says, hey, yo, you, you can't do that. You know, one moose tops. I said, no, 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 no. We came and did this trip like a month ago, and just like this, same gear, Two moose, no problem. The only problem we got is we got a different pilot. Back and forth, back and forth, a lot of arguing. Finally, the pilot says, okay, look, if you did it before, fine. I don't think it's, I think it's too heavy, but we'll give it a try. Backs the plane all the way down to the end of the lake, turns it around, they get the brush out of the way. He says, let's go. Gives it the gas. Full speed down the lake. Gets up enough speed, plane is shuddering. Starts to pull up, plane gets a little bit out of the water, and then, boom crashes. Stuff flies everywhere. Guys fly out of the plane. Moment of silence, crickets in the distance, and the guys kind of pop to the surface of the lake. Whew. Bill, Bill, where are you? I'm over here. Man, where are we? He goes, well, looks like about 500 feet further than the last time. <laughs> now, I think the moral of the story here is what we're going to talk to you about is con continuous delivery. <laughs> it's a form of continuous improvement in software, right? How do we adopt these practices for ourselves? And so what Andrew and I are going to try to do is, let's face it, there are companies who were born in the cloud, built your applications from that from the start. Um, but the truth of the matter is there are a whole lot of us in this room, including us, who have been building our applications before the cloud. And we have a way of doing things, long release cycles, right? Architectures that maybe predated some of this stuff. And yet we want to take advantage of continuous delivery, right? That we, for all the reasons that we all know. So what we want to share with you is how did we go through that transformation? What were all the rocky points we've been through? What did we learn from that? And what do we do about it? So as much as possible, we want to be very practical about that. And so when we thought about this, we said, you know, to be honest, this is, a, you know, just like an addiction. I mean, we've done things a certain way for a long time. We've been trained to do that. We've been rewarded for doing that. And the fact of the matter is, despite the fact that our hearts tell us we want to go in a different direction, the rest of our body still feels that pull towards the way we used to do things. And it's hard to change that behavior, right? So well, maybe you, know you can what? introduce us. I was just going to say, you've been talking all this time and you haven't even introduced yourself. Sorry, sorry. What's your name? So my name is Kendall, and I uh, have a problem with long release cycles that I do on a repeated basis. Hi, Kendall. Come on, everyone. Hi, Kendall. Thank you. Hey, I'm Andrew, and I am an addict. Hi, Andrew. Some of you are a little too good at that, which makes me worry. <laughs> so what we want to do is, the best way to talk about this kind of a problem is the 12-step program. So we're going to take you through the 12 steps of breaking our own addiction to long cycles, talk about how we got there. So let's go through How many of you are familiar with the program? No, you don't need to show your hands. <laughs> Give it to yourself. Step one, admit you have a problem. So here's some good examples of this, right? The emotional reaction. We say, hey, you know, the reason we like big releases is because big rocks make big splashes, right? I mean, we want to make a big dent in the market, big press releases, big, big, big. We love that. And how am I going to do that if I just do it one bite at a time, right? Well, the truth of the matter is you can still accumulate a set of things and make as big a splash as you want. That's just marketing. It's something you can choose to do. Second thing, hey, nine months long, right? The classic arm wrestling with product management. If I don't get it in this release, it's going to be nine months plus another nine months till I see it. We fight to the death, right? And there's cage matches. We put people on an island sometimes. The people that swim ashore get their release features in. It's no way to work. And at the end of the day, what we found is if you deliver incrementally, it turns out you have a lot more flexibility and a lot more voting power than you ever did. Because if you don't get something now, you can change your mind a month from now, and you still got a chance of getting that done right away. 
And last, you know, the worst, the worst problem to have. Don't, you know, try not to talk to too many customers because if they give us feedback that they don't like something, what are we going to do with that? We're already full, <laughs> right? Worst possible thing. We need to go after the next feature because we promised it, even though we did a crappy job of the last one. No good. Andrew, talk to him about what we did for step two. So for continuous delivery, we said, you know, let's, let's try doing what uh, everybody's doing out of, born on the web. We ought to apply the same techniques and, you know, kind of extend that continuous integration where you've got the build, the publish, the deploy, automated testing. And what we found is just getting through that first part of the, um, the pipeline was really challenging, a lot more difficult than we expected. And that's what we're going to take you through, a lot more of the details of what happened, uh, what went well, what didn't go so well. And then lastly, um, even then the, the next step of operating that software in a production environment also turned out to be a lot more challenging than we expected. And in fact, one of the things that we, we found, and we'll tell you a little bit more about it, is that it's not just one box, but we also started to see the need to have multiple production environments hanging off the end of this chain. So just to set this up, so you understand a little bit about our roles. So I'm the managerial part. That means I get to be all rosy and talk to you about how great everything is and everything works. Andrew, for those of you who know him, is the smart one of the two, right? So he gets to actually tell you the reality. So let's well, start with ugly truth part I, two. I'm the extinguished engineer. I mean, <laughs> distinguished engineer. So, so I, 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 you know, I, I, like most of you engineer types, you know, you just you call it like you see it. And the truth is, you know, one of the one of the first problems that we found was. Uh, that our stakeholders, our stakeholders just, that's not the way they roll. And they're, they still want to play the same game that they've been playing. And, and then, but you say, well, wait a second, you know, what we want to do is we want to take some time out of delivering features to go and establish this continuous delivery pipeline and, and you know, build up our automated test cases. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's all really nice, but can you do these 52 other things? Because at the end of the day, that's what they're being measured by. And so that was really uh, a, a real problem. And of course, then you, you get the other one is like, okay, and, and that's fine, but then we get this urgent customer request. So this battle between the things that we need to do to be successful in this and you know, all of the pressures from the external world around us. Uh, the next ugly truth that we came across was even within our team. You know, uh, and we're, we're a global team. We have folks in China, Italy, Poland, Germany, you name it. We have people scattered across the world. Even globe. Canada. Eh? Uh, yes, yeah. that's right. There are a couple of us, eh? Um, but one of the things that we found was that uh, a lot of the developers, we'd find out that they weren't actually writing the tests. And we told them, you know, you can't check in code until you've got the automated test. And the guy would be like, well, yeah, but, you know, the other guy hasn't written the test yet. We're like, what? But you're supposed to write the test. No, 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 that's not my job. It's a tester's job. And so you have the, kind of this caste system that was ingrained into you know, people's minds and behaviors. And so you know, trying to churn that way of thinking was, was not trivial. Um, and actually, I think one of the things that um, became really good, uh, uh, this is more on the good side, so I probably shouldn't tell you about that. <laughs> that's right, that's a managerial job. <laughs> so what do we do about that, right? So first of all, deadlines are dangerous, right? In the sense that there's always this lure that, hey, you know, doing the next feature for the customer is somehow more important than making a system that works and that you can update regularly. That's, that's actually not true. The other guys aren't coming, so they're us, right? Test automation is part of our fundamental job. And as Andrew said, we had to do a few things kind of in a, in a forceful way to make the change happen quicker. Just talking about it and saying that's who we want to be was enough. So we literally said, okay, nobody checks in another feature until a certain set of tests are written, period. Can't be done, right? And after that, in order to check in a new feature, it comes with tests or it doesn't go in the build, period. Um, we even invoked a few hostage scenarios. We had some video clips of family members and kids, but I wouldn't encourage you to do that in a lot of countries. Turns out that's illegal. Well, in some <coughs> countries. In the other right. countries, seal the doors. Right. Um, uh, but, you know, to each their own. Whatever works for you. Just a quick show of hands. I'm curious, you know, some of what we were talking about before about the, these different mindsets. Are, are they familiar to anyone in the room? 
Yeah, so it's not just us. Not my so, job. All right, so we got a bunch of addicts in the room. Let's, we'll be pumping it, never mind. <laughs> so the next hunk of not such happy truth was uh, we did stitch together this beautiful looking on PowerPoint continuous delivery pipeline that took six hours end to end. Unbelievable. I mean, literally for developers to get code in and get it through, and especially when you'd have, you know, one developer is dependent on another developer getting a change through, it could literally be days from the time you, you're ready to do something before you actually see it on the end of the pipeline, um, which is just, you know, it just grinds people to a halt. Um, and the second thing um, was that we were just constantly hitting um, test blockers, where the system would just, it wouldn't work. You know, 50% of our builds, more than 50% of our builds in the early days, just didn't work. Um, so that was, you know, <laughs> a pretty nasty situation. We even, at one point, we kind of instituted a manual fire brigade kind of approach, where we'd manually have, you know, one guy in China would kind of crunch through and, you know, start fixing it and making sure that something's working, and then, you know, he'd kind of pass out out of sheer tiredness, and then somebody would wake up in Germany, and he'd kind of pick up where that guy left off and go until he was, you know, this follow the sun thing is not as good as it sounds. <laughs> So, step four, take inventory of yourself, right? What kind of automation do you really have? So for us, it turns out we had little bits and pieces for sure, but as Andrew said, we had big blind spots, big holes, and it cost us. I can't tell you out of those 50% or more builds that failed, the amount of time we spent a large portion of the team installing, deploying that build, and beginning their work to realize I can't go any further and I gotta go back, right? We, you know, across a team that's distributed across the world, you can imagine that adds up in a hurry. Second thing, uh, continuous delivery, in the sense, can't mean continuously not available, <laughs> right? Please come back tomorrow. Sorry, <laughs> system being updated. Um, so, you know, we, we learned from a lot of the design patterns here in OpenStack, right? It's this idea of multi-instance and how do you kind of roll through these things and keep your user-facing services alive. That was an important principle for us. And the third thing, which, which I can't understate, and I have to admit this was something that we didn't probably recognize as we should. Um, the leaders who get this, who really want to be this kind of team, will not necessarily be the ones you're used to. Um, so what I'd encourage you to do is look very, very hard for these people and help bring them to the front, right? They, you might have had a traditional lead who's the superstar in your domain for 75 years, Right, comes into the walker, you know, mumbles, puts his teeth in, and then codes something that you think is awesome. But that might not be the dude who's going to say, you know what, continuous delivery is really going to help us get there. Find the people who are going to get you there, put them in the light, let other people see them, reward that behavior, and the rest of the people will follow. Very, very important. So this is a bit of an eye chart of what we did, what our environment is. So we, you know, we use our rational, we use a lot of our own tools from IBM, um, and, and in fact, there's a RTC, Rational Team Concert, that's where our source code is. We've got these build engines, and that would k kick off over to Jenkins, which in turn would go and combine all of the components from the various different component teams. And then we put together some really neat stuff. One of the things we called um, uh, Deployinator, which would then go and stand up you know, multiple environments um, where, you know, we just have as many servers that we could put together to go and run a lot of these automated tests. Um, and we developed a Selenium grid. How many people use Selenium for, um, for web-based testing? Great tool. Um, you know, we found initially that it was pretty fragile, and so we actually kind of wrapped it around um, sort of what we called a kind of a grid where we just fire them up whenever we'd need them and, you know, turf them, and, and at least that made us um, very productive. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it took a lot of horsepower and a lot of work to get this kind of stuff together. So that led us to step number five, admit your wrongs and do something about it, right? So one of the first things we learned, so we're development people, right? Development people think, of course my stuff's going to work, right? I'm good. I'm paid a lot of money, and I'm worth it. Right? The reason you have me here is because, you know, I get it done. 
truth of the matter is, no matter how good your automated testing is at any given point in time, and particularly at the beginning when you're kind of crawling your way to get to that critical mass, you're going to let some things through that you're not proud of, right? And so the first thing we learned, right? So OpenStack is wonderful at spinning up a system quickly, right, with an image on it. So that's great. That means we could deploy a new build that we have that we're proud of or we think we're proud of pretty fast. Turns out it's equally good at going the other direction. And it's really important that you figure that out first. So if you walk a wire between two buildings, the first thing you're going to do <laughs> is put a really strong net down there. Because you're just going to feel a lot more confident on that wire knowing that if you fall, odds are it's going to catch you. Although, after a pretty healthy uh, eating experience here in Hong Kong, I'm not sure there's a net that can handle me at this point. But for many of you in the audience, lean and fit. I'm sure it will work. So, so that was something, to be honest, we kind of blundered our way in. So we made mistakes in public in front of our users. The good news was it taught us a valuable lesson. We needed to react quickly. It also taught us a principle of let's make sure we can keep these people up. And even when we make a mistake, we need to think first about defense before offense. Um, and then the second thing, and again, this is something we've seen actually done very well in many places in OpenStack itself, which is you know, the idea of the feature switch or the config setting, right? I'm not yet confident in this. It's not fully cooked. Looks great on the outside. The icing is good. If you put your thumb in the middle, quite gooey in the center, right? Not ready for eating, um, but we want you to mess with it. So it's there, but it turns out if it's still not quite done, flip the switch, go back to what we know works for sure, and we'll gradually go live with it when we're ready. So the idea of these kind of strangler patterns sort of choking out the old features when you're confident in the new ones and allowing this kind of continuously available system was very important. Which brings me to some more ugly truth. Uh, so we said, uh, you know, so now the test automation, it's part of our lives, go do it. Uh, unfortunately, that's not enough direction for a team. In fact, we, we even had kind of a, one of the guys who kind of led it, he's like, yeah, you know, just, just go and do it. Write tests. You know, when you have a team of, you know, hundreds of people scattered across the globe in different languages and stuff, in Italian, how do you say, write, just do it? What, what does that mean? Um, so, you know, we had to get a little bit more prescriptive and start telling a lot more specific, how do you do it? How do you write good test cases? In fact, that was one of the other things. Right, you know, of all the tests that were being written, how many of them were actually good? And that would, would actually work from um, iteration to iteration. So it's very easy to make poor tests and, and fragile tests. So we had to, in, in, no other way was but to invest in learning it and then communicating that back so that others could benefit from it. Because, you know, at the end of the day, when we just kind of let it loose, you get anything from awesome to oh my god. A drunk man who just like went and wrote a test. Anyways, right. So that led to step number six: remove your defects. Right. Find out what's wrong. So the first most brilliant inspirational moment for us: Hey, it turns out test automation is code. What a shock! And I, you know, it sounds silly, but I'll tell you, we didn't treat it with the same respect, and we paid for that, just as Andrew said. You know, we had build breaks, you know, rev builds constantly that it, we would go and look and say, no, actually, that was fine. Just the tests were bad, right? So lots and lots of lessons here, very practical ones. First of all, right, treat it like anything else you do. So if you do code reviews, do code reviews. If you, you know, have something around, uh, you know, promotional system, go through some gates, do that for your test autom automation, just like your features. Step number one. Second thing, we introduced, very late, by the way, the concept of what we call a non-voting test case. And I think that concept exists here in, in the OpenStack efforts as well. Meaning that, hey, this is a test that is not yet robust enough to stand up and give me solid results under every case. But it's necessary. I do want to run it, but it doesn't, if it fails, it does not stop the train, right? So having this idea of saying these are in progress and these are sturdy and a benchmark for me to say green or not, really, really critical, right, in having that, that two-class system. Second thing, uh, tests are atomic. We had a lot of folks, as Andrew said, you know, we started with this wonderful idea of, well, you know, we got professional folks. Well, all we got to do is say, dude, write test automation. You all know how to do that, right? Go, do test automation, right? <laughs> this is a little even more inspiring than that. It's hard to imagine, right? But I mean, I'm, I can really whip into a frenzy. Um, so, you know, 
uh, it turns out you let the flowers bloom and you get a lot of weeds. So we had lots of cases where people wrote a test case that said, well, you know, I mean, the one I wrote three things ago, surely that's run and left behind some stuff that this test case is expecting. Well, not really. Turns out when we mix and match those things, that stuff didn't work. So they need to be self-contained. Third, tests can't have allergies, meaning that, you know, sensitivities. So we found things, selenium is a good example of that, right? Where we're looking for something on some part of the screen. Well, in the meantime, we do a little user feedback. The users say, I universally hate you, and I will kill you and everyone who looks like you, plus your family members, just to throw it in. It's that bad. And we say, you're right, I feel terrible, go back and fix it, change the screen, they love it, our tests break. Because where's pixel 47 down and 32, right? So think about that stuff. Think about the stuff you want to change and make sure your tests have some way of beaconing in on those changes. IDs, immutable objects, and enforce that, right? Step number four, um, what will you vary? We found a lot of wasted effort because one person running a test case would come up with three images that they thought tested some combination of interesting things. The person sitting right next to him, literally, would write a test case and create three different images, sort of kind of like that, but not really, that did this. Now, you can imagine the fun we had with build breaks where we said, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. It works great with mine. Say, so, yeah, but we had that other image that the other dude put there, and when that ran, it, well, what, what image is he using? <laughs> oh, right? So at the end of the day, these things, you know, your variation points, your environments, your, uh, your variables, your configurations, your content, right? have a strategy for how to do that. There is a repository, a URL, where these are the images that we'll test. All tests are written to loop through that. That way we can change our mind. If we have some new interesting combination, we saw it at a customer, we throw it in there, we run the whole battery, and we see if we live or if we die, right? But that takes effort, takes thought, takes design. This is code, right? Um, and last, load and stress test your system. So we have some fabulous engineers here in the room who helped us a lot with this. So functional testing is great, but then we realized we need to put the system under stress, we need to vary our workloads, we need to simulate lots of users hitting this at once, simulate concurrency. This is where the really fun problems exist. So when we got better at doing the basics, we started to layer on the more advanced things. And again, it pointed out a lot of cracks in our foundation. Very helpful. Step seven then, remove your shortcomings with humility. <clears throat> what, what this meant is, Andrew talked at the beginning about this six hours, right? The, from the moment I put my line of code somewhere, then we churned through this incredibly long pipe. So that was, you know, the Alaskan pipeline when we really needed one from about here to the front door, right? So how do we shorten that? First of all, make it a lot easier for people to sample their work. Sandbox build. How do I take my one little change and incrementally test it against something that's the known content so that I got a pretty good chance that unless my buddy next door checks in some conflicting change, it's gonna pass tonight. So I don't get bothered, right? Awesome. Test as a service. So our initial version of this was done in a you know, more manual way. Load these things in your workspace, try to run them. That's pretty expensive. And again, we found cases where people had very different versions of things that got very different results. So why not apply a cloud to this problem, right? If these are the tests I wanna run, then I can provision the tests, run the tests that I want, put them away, voila. Consistency, on demand, this is what clouds do, right? And then last, publicize your results. I mean, this is what we do, right? Builds are like breathing. So um, we wanted a way to have peer pressure be the mechanism. So, you know, there's a website every member of the team understands. You go out and it says, here's the last good build. Here's the one that was done before that. Here's all the tests and that one is wrong. That one failed, right? And everyone goes, sweet, Edmund. Nice, right? <laughs> and then we have a pack of people with torches who follow him to the garage and beat him unconscious. Well, but that's because Edmund lives Are we in, filming? That's only because Edmund lives in Texas. Right, right. That's right. perfectly acceptable. We don't beat people in other places, but in Texas, that's how it gets done. And Edmund, you break it again, I swear to God, I will pull this car over and you don't even <laughs> want to know. All right, so that takes us to step eight. Apologize to those you have harmed. Right? <laughs> not, not Edmund, though. Not Edmund. I'm not apologizing to you, Edmund. You broke the bill. I'm going to. One more. Okay. So for this one, we said, you know what? We have uh, an interesting problem as well, which is, and, and I'm sure this doesn't happen anywhere in the room. I think this is unique to us. But on the drawing board, it looks beautiful. This is a work of art. 
pure Picasso with the sideways nose and everything, just the way I love it. And when I translate it into code, I run my tests and I hang it on the wall and I say, man, I love that. Turns out, sometimes when the paint goes on the canvas, it doesn't quite turn out the way I had it in my head. And in front of our customers, it, yes, it does work. Yes, it can be made to work. But in practical terms, it's awkward. There are some things you didn't get, right? Tangible things about what it takes for me to keep it running, not to get it running, right? So we decided, you know what? The first instance of this continuous delivery pipeline is going to be for us. So we forced our team and members of our team to use the product we were building every day while we were building it, right? Why? Because we wanted to learn from ourselves, and we wanted to make sure we didn't put something in front of our clients that we ourselves were not capable of using. That's pretty embarrassing. And secondly, it was a way for us to get this system working, built, tested in a little bit less public way, right? You probably don't want to go live with your continuous delivery pipeline in front of your banking application for your customers. <laughs> I mean, you might because you're, you know, good and really confident, but this might be an alternative for you. Um, and then the last part, Andrew talked a little bit about that pipeline. He said that last box called production, right? Well, that's the last step, right? Go live, bring the, bring the new change up. Well, it turns out, as we got into this more and more, we realized there's lots of different ways we go live. We go live for our internal cloud. We go live for a beta site that's hosted, that our customers can try things out and write little Facebook-like comments on the wall. You suck, or that's awesome, right? <laughs> Hopefully more of the latter than the first. Um, and, and you know, we want to do these things for multiple development teams and multiple geographies. Ultimately, even some of our clients started to see this stuff and say, you know, I can envision a day where I actually subscribe to the same pipe and take updates to your product from you in that same way. Still ahead of us, not quite there, but again, you can imagine it. So we really adopted this idea of a publish and subscribe, meaning that our product had the idea, like a Yum repository, right? look for the changes, pull them on a schedule or policy that that particular instance requires. If it's the internal cloud, I want to update it daily. If it's a beta site, maybe once a week, because updating every day is not good for the customers. They, they can't keep up with their stuff, right? Uh, might be different for a production customer who says, I got a change window every 30 days. Who knows? But this idea of sort of done once, um, placed into an approved repository, and then pulled to multiple instances actually turned out to be a very powerful concept. Well, and ultimately, it's giving the customers the choice, right? right? How, how do they want to get, I mean, you know, who knows? There may be some customers that are still happy with those old school ways of, you know, every six, nine months or whatever, boom, major up, upgrade. Um, but, you know, for those other more pro progressive companies that want to get the latest and greatest, they're, they're happy to do that too. Right. So I think choice is a pretty important piece. Which leads to step nine which is make direct amends, except when doing so would harm them, right? And so this is feedback, right? This says that, again, no matter how well you do, at the end of the day, you should assume that sometimes things aren't going to go the way you want. And you need to make sure that in order to save your face, right, to make sure you're strong in front of your users, that they have a quick way of talking to you, letting you know, right? Because as long as they think you're listening, and as long as you can do something about it, you can use that safety net if you need it, or you can roll forward quickly, things are going to be fine, and they're going to be a part of your community, people who are helping you make themselves be more successful. If you don't listen, and if they can't talk to you, you are the enemy. You are the people who are in the way of them getting their job done, and this whole thing is going to fall, right? Um, so let them talk to you, talk back, let them know you're listening, um, and at the end of the day, make it easy, because let's face it, you know, surveys and all that other nonsense, none of us have any time. we got three minutes a day that's free, and that's for me walking from here to the bathroom, right? So if I can sort of Bluetooth you something, that's about all I got. So keep it short and keep it sweet. Well, as you can imagine, there's a little bit more of the ugly truth. Um, and, and frankly, uh, you know, it, it's great when we see all these born on the web type apps out there, and they're awesome, and they're taking advantage of cool things like, you know, Netflix, Simeon Army. Isn't that awesome? But how many of you out there, like me, are addicted to legacy apps that were built sometime before the, the, this you know, kind of web world? Anybody out there? Yeah, OK, there are a few of you. Uh, and, and this is the thing, is they just weren't designed for 
this kind of rolling updates and this kind of incremental, you know, maybe take down parts of the system while you're upgrading other parts, but overall the system stays alive. Unfortunately, we're just not all there yet. Um, and so, you know, in, in some ways we started trying to take advantage of a lot of the techniques from OpenStack or that you get from an OpenStack world. Um, but, you know, in, in some cases we use kind of more traditional um, HA techniques um, and, and, you know, even using things like DRDB and, um, you know, uh, kind of the traditional style for traditional clustering, which is fine. Um, at least that kind of gives gives our, our customers something reliable while we're incrementally evolving our system to take advantage of the more modern approaches to develop, to develop our apps. But that takes time and that takes change. Which leads us to step number 10. Continue to inventory yourself and deal with your shortcomings. So as, as Andrew said, I mean the trick here is um, don't wait, right? So we all have these applications that are a little bit of a Frankenstein, whether we like it or not. There are parts of the system that you say, wow, this is nice, we've been able to renovate that, uh, that part of the house, it looks pretty good, we're happy to have the guests come in, and it kind of does what we want. We never let them go in the back room, right? Because the back room's got dead bodies, cats that you know, we haven't seen in two years, you know, food, stuff I, I don't even want to talk about, right? So that's, <laughs> that's just the nature of our applications. Um, you can, you know, get caught in this idea that, well, until I redesign my application in an open stack-like manner, multiple instances, separate out my data, you know, it's just not ready for this sort of live updating. Don't wait. Don't wait. Fact of the matter is, as your application, as you renovate one room of your house at a time, um, your system will get better and better, and these short downtime windows will disappear. And that's what you want. Um, so initially, it may be that you say, well, I've got to be a little careful when I make changes to one part of my system because it's not very well designed for that, and I have to take the system down for 10 minutes in order to bring it up. Okay, not ideal, but get started. Do it. And then fix that part of the house so that the guests can kind of wander around on their own. Right? And the last part is lights out operation. And I'll tell you, this is another one we underbid. So, Andrew's right. In the dev environment, we found that, oh, you know, it's great to be a developer because we have no rules at all, right? I mean, you can whip stuff up, you can tear it down, you can put whatever you want in there, you can try something different. If you don't like it, you scratch it, reboot, whatever, right? I mean, it's a very flexible environment. The minute we crossed over this very thick line where he said, okay, love this change, it's awesome, we're going to put it in production for our users. You know, we walked, there's like a little trip wire, sort of a laser <laughs> beam. An alarm goes off, a bunch of people wearing black fly through the windows, put, you know, tranquilizer darts in you, and then, you know, examine you for security threats, <laughs> right? So the rules take over, and I guarantee you every one of us has them, right? We have these procedures we have to follow. We have auditing. We have HIPAA regulations. We have, Lord only knows, we all got them, these scrolls of, you know, ancient text from the Roman Empire that, you know, <laughs> has been translated into <laughs> IT. So the rules matter, and there's no way around them. You may evolve, but you'll evolve slowly. So what we also figured out is um, it's not only important to automate the deployment of the application and the change to that application, but we also got to automate the wiring of that thing to these procedures and these tools and management practices that our company requires. Because if we don't, all that fabulous flexibility, all that speed we build for ourselves comes to a screeching halt, and days or weeks, literally, can go by. Right? So we used a lot of workflows and other things that we had in our solution in order to put those things together, put the wiring diagram in place, and it allowed us to snap those things up but maintain the auditability and compliance that we needed. Very important. Which is, frankly, one of the reasons why we built this product. Exactly right. So last, step 11. Meditate to continue forward. Right? When you found inner peace, Continuous delivery is working for you. The features are rolling steadily out the door. There's music, incense perhaps, maybe <laughs> something stronger, just saying. <laughs> Don't advocate it, know what happens. Um, you know, the other thing that we learned, and this was my own change, right? As a manager, right, what am I trained to do? I'm trained to walk around with a clipboard and track, because we love to track. Where are you? How long is that gonna take? You know, do you really have to go to the bathroom now because I really need this checked in? What are you doing? And we tap people with pencils and stuff like that. And it's actually a lot of fun. So it's kind of hard to put that down because I enjoy it a lot. 
Uh, but it turns out in this world, what you're really trying to do is, if you're going to change your behavior, you've got to change what it is you inspect, right? And what we really want to do is, I don't want to know pace. I don't want to know how fast you are doing something. When is this going to be done? The classic question that pretty much every developer hates. Instead, what I want to know is, who's using the stuff? What are they telling you? What did we do about it? How well do they like it? What's the next thing we're going to do? Right? If we can shift ourselves into that mentality, then everyone's thinking forward. Everyone's thinking positively, right? What can we do next? Did we get it right? Are people digging it? And what's next, right? Power, powerful psychology. I promise you this will make a huge difference. It makes my job a lot easier, right? Um, so you know, it doesn't mean that speed doesn't matter. We don't live in markets by ourselves. There are competitors. All that stuff is fine. There's people who are angry with you almost always. Um, but it, it's different. It's speed for the sake of being delightful to your customers. And that's what matters. That's a different way of thinking. Which brings us to the last step. So step 12, you get through the entire program. Your addiction is broken, <laughs> right? The last thing you do, once awakened, carry your message to others in despair, which I think is why all of you are here in this room. And hopefully we've, we've had some success in doing that. <laughs> I could give you some examples. So in six months since we implemented this, um, literally, and you know, because we're IBM and Lord knows we love measuring stuff. We got more metrics than, you know, we're measured by the kilogram of metric, apparently it's part of my appraisal system. Um, so, but literally we got, you know, reduction in labor, meaning the kinds of things we usually had to do for build, for testing, for things like that, seven to one. And, and believe me, there is a lot more we can do, a lot more we can do. We are far from the end of this journey, right? Uh, more than 3,300 builds in that length of time, and the amount of time that it took us to generally resolve some problem went down by more than half, right? Um, that's, you know, and that's not small change. It's not. It adds up day after day after day. Now, I will tell you, like any addict, we still have our days where we kind of fall retreat. off the wagon. We fall off the wagon. The stress comes, such and such customer called, such and such competitors doing something. We got to do something today. Can't you just do this one special thing, right? So you're going to feel that pull. Don't be afraid of it. Just remember, find your partner, as I do, <laughs> talk each other down, right? Put the glass down, let's go back, implement the feature, make sure the test automation is right, deliver it as soon as it's ready, and we're confident in what we've got. Okay? So that said, thanks everyone. Thanks Appreciate your time. Hopefully uh, this will help. Good luck on your journey. <laughs>